In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I am, Jesus says. I am. These are the climactic words today as we approach ever nearer to the cross and to Holy Week. These were the final dramatic words with which Jesus left those he was arguing with in the temple before they tried to kill him, before he hid himself from them and went out from them. I am. There was the whole question. Who is this Jesus? After all, here he is. He shows up in the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. There at the Feast of Tabernacles was the great celebration of the Lord guiding his people through the wilderness, guiding them in the pillar of fire and the light that illuminated their way, providing for them water out of the rock. And here Jesus shows up in the middle of their celebrations and says, I am the light. I am the water, living water, poured out for you. Here Jesus shows up in the temple preaching about himself, as if the scriptures were all about him, as if it was all about him from the beginning. Who does this guy think he is? Well, that's exactly the question. Who is he? Who are you, Jesus? Who do you make yourself out to be? Question All throughout this dialogue, we just get the end of it here in our gospel reading. But it's the question all throughout the gospels. Whenever Jesus is dealing with the people of Israel, whenever he's debating with the Pharisees or simply the poor people gathered for the feast, who are you, Jesus? What is his identity? How is it defined? How is it established? Now, we know a thing or two today about identity, Our culture is all screwed up over it, all confused and arguing about whose identity is what, and what defines it, what defines who you really are. Our culture would largely have you believe it's something within you, maybe some inner voice. If you just listen to that, then you're being true to yourself, then you are being who you really are, that's your identity. Well, nothing like that is in the scriptures. And I'll warn you now, that's a dangerous path to go down, listening to your own heart rather than the voice of the Lord. Well, then what defines you? Something else then, something outside of you. Maybe it's what you do. Now, men know this and have this problem particularly when you meet another man. First, if you want to know who he is, you ask his name, and then the very next question, what do you do? Maybe that's what defines who you are. What do you do? Or maybe in our age of digital media, instant, on-demand, whatever you want, maybe it's who do you listen to? Who is it that you're listening to? What media are you consuming? What is the voice that's teaching you, that's guiding you? Or maybe it has something else. Maybe it has to do with your race. Maybe it has to do with your parents. Maybe it has to do with where you come from. Maybe that's what defines who you are. These are the questions that they're arguing with Jesus about? Where do you come from? What is it that you're here to do? Who is it that you are to listen to? They find out as they have this conversation with Jesus about these questions, about who he is, about identity, they find out from him that their own identity is not at all what they thought. They claimed that they were Israel, that they were the sons of God, the heirs of Abraham, that the scriptures were about them and their people, and their life, and their salvation. They find out from Jesus that he is not who they thought, that in fact he is the true Israel, that the scriptures are about him. And dear saints, I'll simply tell you this, that it is only in Jesus, in his identity, that you can know who you are and know your identity. So his accusers, his opponents here, the Jews there gathered for the feast at the temple, They want to believe that it's their parents, it's their family, their heritage that defines who they are, that they are the sons of Abraham, indeed sons of God. But Jesus says to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. If you loved God, if you knew God, you would love me. Now there's a certain accusation here, not just for them, but even for us, dear saints. If you knew God as your father, if indeed he were your father, would you not live like it? 
would you not love like that were the case? Here, Jesus is bringing up to them, what do they do? How does this define them? Indeed, that's what John the Baptist told them long ago before this. Don't think that you're children of Abraham. After all, God can raise up from these stones children from Abraham. Repent. What is it you're doing? Are you living like the heirs of Abraham? But now Jesus bakes something else into these words. You would love me. And they might justly ask him, Jesus, the Lord commanded us to love him. To love him with all our heart and mind and strength. That was the commandment. Why should we love you? Well, he says, I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Now he brings up where he is from. What defines him is not just who he is standing there in front of him, but where he came from. And that's what they're trying to get to the bottom to. They know him as Jesus of Nazareth. They know his brothers and his sisters, his mother and his father, they think. Where does he think he comes from? Who is this guy? Well, and he brings up to them again, then, where they come from. How does that define them? They say, we come from Abraham, we come from God. He says, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. How is this for an accusation, dear saints? You are not of God as you thought. You are of none other than the devil. Now consider Adam. Adam, indeed, in Luke's gospel, in the genealogy, is called a son of God. In a sense, he was not a natural son, a born son, but created. He was the first made, the first born, so to speak. And then he chose to listen to the devil rather than to God. And there's that third question. Who do you listen to? Adam, indeed, had more acclaim than any of you to be a son of God, at least at first. Yet what defined him? Did he decide to listen to that inner voice that told him to be true to himself? He decided to listen, indeed, to the devil, tempting him along. Indeed, in a certain way, Adam was able to change his own parentage, his own lineage. He was a son of God. He made himself and all his offspring sons of the devil. The devil had no right, no right by nature to rule over this world. Man, whom God made to rule and govern the world, gave it over to him, gave themselves over to him. So Jesus can tell them, you are of your father, the devil. And not only is that where they come from, who their parents are, so to speak, but now it flows over into what they do, and that indeed comes to define them. Your will is to do your father's desires. Dear saints, any time you seek to do your own sinful desires, what has been put into your own heart from Adam, indeed from the devil and his tempting, you prove yourself a son of the devil. Whenever you hate your brother, whenever you lie, as he is indeed the father of lies, whenever you seek your own benefit and not that of others, whenever you glory in your own pride, seek yourself, you prove yourself children of the devil. But that's not the end of the story, of course. There's more to come. Your parentage is not fixed in the devil, thanks be to God. So who then are they going to listen to? These sons of the devil who think they're sons of God, who think they're the heirs of Israel. He says, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Where they came from now defines who they listen to. And that indeed has defined who they are and what they do. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. Well, who indeed is that? Who is of God? It's not Adam anymore. He was. But now who is of God? Who in this whole scene, in this whole conversation could claim it? They want to claim they're children of God, children of Israel, heirs of all the promises, They're speaking to Jesus. And Jesus lets them know, I came from God, and I am here. He knows God in a way they do not. If I were to say I do not know him, he says, I would be a liar like you, like your father, the devil. But I know him. He comes from God. Jesus indeed comes from God, and this means also then that he listens to God. For he keeps the word of God. I know him and I keep his word. If anyone hears the words of God, 
Whoever is of God hears the words of God. And indeed, Jesus says, whoever then keeps these words that Jesus has received from God, he will not taste death. Jesus is the true Son from the Father. Jesus is not just some man raised up in power, raised up to be a great prophet. He's not just some wise man who came onto the scene. He is none other than the one who was there from the beginning, the one through whom the world was made. He is the one who was there in the wilderness leading the Israelites on by his own glorious light. He is the one who fed them manna from heaven, who gave them water out of the rock, living water. The rock, indeed, as Paul says, was Christ there in the wilderness, feeding them, supplying them, guiding them. So Jesus shows up, indeed, in the temple and preaches about nothing else than what the Scriptures are about. He preaches about Himself. I am, He says. I am the light. I am the rock. I am the shepherd. When He says, I am the shepherd, He's taking up the prophecy of Ezekiel, that the good shepherd would come, to govern and feed and pasture his people. When he says, I am the vine, he is claiming nothing else than to be the true vine of David, into which all the people will be grafted in for their salvation. Jesus is the true son. He is the heir. And anyone else who speaks to him and claims to be an heir had better have pretty good credentials to claim what's his by right. Dear saints, you need something else than your own parentage, your own lineage from Adam. You need some other background, some other genealogy for yourself if you claim to be heirs with Jesus. So indeed, Jesus is from the Father. He listens to the word of the Father. He is, in fact, the will of the Father, made flesh, acting out that will in the world, which means that he is also then defined by what he does. I do not seek my own glory, he says. There is one who seeks it, He is the judge. There is one, the Father, who seeks the glory of Christ. He, he says, glorifies him. I do not glorify myself. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. Dear saints, the glory of Christ is nothing else than the cross. When he speaks of his glorification, he speaks of what is about to befall him there in Jerusalem. He speaks of being lifted up, being exalted, His arms stretched wide over the earth. Sins of the world laid upon his shoulders. There is the glory of Christ. The Father glorifies him. And Jesus himself then is none other than the true Isaac, the true beloved son of the Father brought to the sacrifice. And yet at the very same time, he is the true lamb, the lamb whom the Lord himself provides for the burnt offering. This is what Jesus does. He is the high priest for you, sacrificing himself, cleansing by the means of his own blood. And now then, if that indeed is what Jesus does as the Son of the Father, now we come to you. Because Jesus wasn't glorified for himself. He was already eternally in glory. He didn't need the cross for that. Jesus wasn't lifted up on the cross for his own benefit. He wasn't lifted up on the cross so that he could be seen and magnified by the world simply for his own sake. He did it for you. He did it for your salvation, for you sinners, for you children even of the devil, as your father Adam has made it to be so. And now this story has to do with you. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. And indeed, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. Who indeed is that? Those who listen to his word. Those who hear the promise of his salvation wrought in the very wood of the cross for you. Those who hear that word and keep it. Those are the ones who will never taste death. To keep his word is to hold it fast. It's to believe it. It's to hold it within your heart, to trust in it, to rely upon it, to be formed by it. Indeed, dear saints, may we even use the word identify. Your identity is in the word of Christ. That's what defines you. And so if you listen to his word and you keep it and you hold it fast, indeed, you will never see death. That is the promise of Jesus Christ for you. How can this be, they cry out. Abraham died. Abraham, who was known for his faithfulness, 
Abraham, who the one thing he is especially celebrated for in the scriptures is that he believed God and heard his words, he died, as did the prophets. How can you say this, Jesus? Are you greater than Abraham? Indeed, I am, Jesus says. I am. Before Abraham was ever a thought or a dream, before Abraham ever came into this world, I am. Not I was, not I will be, not I came to be, simply he is. And dear saints, what he is, he is for you. He isn't in this world, in the flesh, speaking of these people for his own sake. He's there for you so that you too may be greater even than Abraham. That you may never taste death that you may be in Christ, and that all that is Christ may be given to you. He who is the Lamb is now your shepherd, and you are his dear sheep. He who is the word of the Father gives to you his own word, that you may hold it and keep it. He who has righteousness comes to give righteousness to you. You now have a new lineage a new genealogy. As he is the son of the father, he has made you to be sons of the father, children of God, the true Israel, the heirs of all the promises. Now, because he is, you are, and you will be even into eternity. Before Abraham was, Jesus is. And now, after this world has passed away, after heavens and earth have decayed, after sin itself, after death itself have been defeated, you still will be in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.